Hey y'all, Coach and Fight here, doing a class on the Shepherd of Hermes. Now, it's been a long time since we've done a class on the Shepherd of Hermes. Um, but praise our Father in Heaven. This, I believe, is what we've been expired to do uh, today. Maybe even a series on it, but let's go in here and let's pull it up first. All right, so let's go to Wikipedia first. It says, the shepherd of Hermes, in Latin would be Pastor Herme, sometimes just called the shepherd, is a Christian literary work of the late first half of the second century, considered a valuable book by many Christians and considered canonical scripture by some of the early church fathers such as Arrhenius. Now from what I understand the earliest compilation of New Testament documents contained the Shepherd of Hermes as well as the book by Barnabas. But anyway it says here the shepherd was very popular among Christians in the second, third, and fourth centuries which would have been a time leading up to Constantine. So for it to be cut off in the fourth century, which would include the year 325 or 312, uh, when Constantine came into power, forming what we know now as the Catholic Church, is when it shut the uh, Shepherd of Hermas down. So this is now why we are just now hearing about it again. And then it goes on to say that it is found in the Codex Sinaiticus. Let's click on that. Okay, it says here, Codex Sinaiticus, or the Sinai Bible, is a 4th century Christian manuscript of the Bible containing the majority of the Greek Old Testament and the Greek New Testament written upon unctual letters upon parchment. And from what I understand, there are more writings found of the Shepherd of Hermas on parchment than they found of the book of Matthew. In other words, more people had a copy of the Shepherd of Hermas back in the fourth century than did they have a copy of the book of Matthew. But anyway, it says here, it is one of the four great unctual codexes. And I don't know much about these codices. I think it's properly pronounced. So if you can help us out. But anyway, it says, along with Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Vaticanus, it is one of the earliest and most complete manuscripts of the Bible and contains the oldest complete copy of the New Testament. So that's what we were saying earlier about the oldest complete copy of the New Testament. And that's important because the Shepherd of Hermas would be considered a New Testament book. Unlike the book of Enoch, which would be considered an Old Testament book, the book called the Shepherd of Hermas, just like the book called the Gospel of Thomas, and the book we referenced earlier, Barnabas, those would be in the New Testament. Those are New Testament documents. But what we're talking about here is this Codex Sinaiticus or the Sinai Bible, which contained the oldest copies or the oldest copy, oldest complete copy of the New Testament also contained the Shepherd of Hermas, as well as the book of Barnabas. Let's see if it mentions Barnabas here. All right, coming all the way down here, let me just read it. It says, the portion of the codex held by the British Library consists of 346 and a half folios, 694 pages, consisting of over half the original work. Of these folios, 199 belong to the Old Testament, including the Apocrypha, and 147 and a half belong to the New Testament, along with the other books, the Epistle of Barnabas and part 
of the Shepherd of Hermes. Now, now that's interesting how it says part of the Shepherd of Hermes. So now that sounds like something we can cover in another video. Which part? Because when you come over here and you look at the book, you find out that there are actually three parts in the Shepherd of Hermes. You have the first book, which is called Visions. In that chapter, Hermes seems to have a dream or a vision, as it's called, of the church who spoke with him and actually explained to him how she was created. It ends in chapter four or vision four, which is a vision of the apocalypse or the tribulation. Then you have the second book of the Shepherd of Hermas called His Commands, which is where Hermas takes some instructions. He's told some things that he must do and change about himself if he actually wants to survive the tribulation. Well, actually, I should say that he's given these instructions so that he can hear from an angel. And it is that angel who in the next part of the book, let's go down to part three. It is this angel who explains the vision that Hermes had in the first book in great detail. He kind of goes in and explains the construction of the tower that we now know as the church. Now, there is actually nine similitudes or parables, which we're more familiar with. But it is the ninth one in which the tower is built. I would also mention that similitude eight is very similar to similitude nine. Similitude eight talks about the willow tree and the rods. But those rods turn out to be very similar to the stones that we hear about in similitude nine. So, praise our Father in Heaven. We're going to put this down as our first installment to this series on the Shepherd of Hermes. Lord willing. But, just in case this is the only video you get to see on the subject, let's come down to around verse 144 in similar to 9, where it talks about these demons or these wicked spirits that are to come upon man. These are who are responsible for destroying man, or I should say, the wicked seed among man. We're here in the New Testament where it talks about the wheat and the tares. Well, this is how you get rid of the tares, or this is how the Elohim will get rid of the tares, is through these powers here. Let me just read it. Matter of fact, let me start up here at verse 140 because this may be the most important lesson out of this entire book is on these powers and these virtues. Now, the powers, we remember Paul told us about the powers. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Well, the principalities affect governments and institutions and countries, um, whereas powers affect individuals. And these are the powers that we are dealing with down here in verse 144. But you also have equal and opposite virtues at play as well. And the way it turns out, we want to attract the virtues all at the same time, pushing away the powers. So let's briefly discuss who they are here, starting at verse 140. And I said, sir, tell me the names of these virgins and of those women that were clothed with the black garment. So what Hermes has heard so far was of, like I said, these virgins and the women in the black garments. The virgins have been assisting in the building of the tower. They've actually been the ones who have been carrying the stones. You have these angelic figures 
um, who are working to dig up the stones, but they give them to these virgins or virtues who carry them on their shoulder and actually give them to um, other angelic figures who actually put the stones, who is us, into the tower. And on the other hand, you have the women in the black garments whose responsibility it was to carry off the rejected stones. Some of the stones were not um, adequate for the tower, for lack of a better word, and they were rejected. Well, for the rejected stones, when it was time to clean up the tower, they sent in these women with the black garments who cheerfully picked the rejected stones up and carried them back to where they got them from. And so Hermes is like, who, who are these women? But anyway, in verse 141, the angel who is speaking to Hermes says, here, said he, the names of those virgins, which are the more powerful and stand at the corners of the gate. These are their names. So again, referring back to this tower that's being built. See, we're all the way up here in verse 140. So you can imagine we've, we've gone through a lot of this tower building. Um, it's not really all done, but we, we see how this tower has been built so far when you read or listen to the whole chapter. What you'll find is that the tower has a gate. The gate turns out to be our Messiah. And the tower turns out to be the kingdom of heaven or something like that. But anyway, verse 142 says, The first is called faith. The second, countenance. The third, power. The fourth, patience. And the rest which stand beneath these are simplicity, innocence, chastity, cheerfulness, truth, understanding, concord, and charity. So here are our virtues or the virtues which we must take on like we see there in verse 143. And this is why I say this is the most important part in the book because this is something we have to do on an individual basis. You know, it's not prophecy, you know, it's not, you know, the fall of Babylon or, you know, what the Elohim is about to do or you know, any of that, you know, what's going on in the world. This is on a individual basis down to the core of actually who we who we are. This is, you know, what the New Testament referred to as dying daily. Well, when we start to change ourselves to where we attract these virtues, we have to attract them. That's important. Many of us will go through a transition to where we're no longer like ourselves at all. We, we completely, we're dead. That person has died as he takes on stuff like countenance. And it's important to look up these words, power, patience. Don't forget about faith. That's the first one. Those are the big four. But then once you take on those four, you find out back there in visions that these other ones come along with it. That's simplicity, being innocent, having chastity, being cheerful. Of course, we have to take on truth, understanding, concord, and charity. And this is, I say those are important because that's why we're going to get back into some of this Herman stuff. Um, praise our Father in heaven. I believe I got a little bit of taste of, you know, how all of this is going to work. Whereas, you know, let me just say, is, 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 take it literally. When he says that these women are going to come to um, escort these people back to where they came from, it will be those people who fail to put on these these virtues. So, like we said, we have to do this individually. So this makes this important. You know, we really got to study this. But anyway, verse 143 says, Whosoever therefore bear these names and the names of the Son of God, shall enter into the kingdom of God. So now this is probably the most important verse because, you know, understanding these virgins up here or these virtues and um, what their names are, 
is talking about the kingdom of God here, that thousand year reign. Anybody who wants to live in the thousand year reign is is saying here, um, will have will bear these the names of these virtues. You know, they will have chastity, they will have cheerfulness, they will have truth. Um, it says and the names of the Son of God. Now it may be worth going ahead and looking at this word Son of God here. Because this is talking about our Messiah. And it's also talking about the name. As we've always heard, we're saved by the name. Just flipping through a few of those, when we come back to verse 24, um, I'd have to look and see what chapter this is. It says, Now this law is the Son of God, who is preached to all the ends of the earth. The people that stand under its shadow are those which have heard his preaching and believed. So this is defining who the Son of God is, who the Messiah is actually, which we shouldn't be surprised. We've always heard that the Messiah is the word made flesh. So that word is the law. He is the law made flesh is what we're gathering here out of the Shepherd of Hermes. And I remind you. That before Constantine came into power, this book was more popular than the book of Matthew. So anybody who wants to go to the kingdom of heaven, this, this book is probably the most important book. Because like we said, this is, on a per this is what we have to do. This is on a personal level. But anyway, let's go to verse 144, which says, Here now, said he, the names of those women which were clothed with the black garment. Again, these were the women who were assigned to carry away the wicked women. It says, of these, four are the principal. The first is perfidiousness. The second, incontinence. The third, infidelity. The fourth, pleasure. And like we said, we want to look up these words. So now when we were talking about the virtues, we find out that when you take on the first four then the other ones come after well we can imagine that it's similar when it comes to um, these powers if it doesn't say it directly that you would have some or maybe even all of these first four powers um, these women clothed in the black garment that are a part of your life until we actually change. Like I said, this involves change. We have to put these away. If not, then we start to experience these other ones, which we learn about in verse 145, which says, and the rest which follow are called thus, sadness, malice, lust, anger, lying, foolishness, pride, and hatred. Praise our Father in heaven for his word because we can gain the understanding that if we have any of these elements in our life, then there's an issue and there's something that we need to personally work on. It says, the servant of God, which carries these spirits, shall see indeed the kingdom of God, but he shall not enter into it. And this is kind of referring to the pole shift because it happens so suddenly. I think Revelation says in one place a day, but in another place it says it's going to change in an hour. So where a lot of us will make it to that point because we have some of these powers affecting us, we'll end up destroying at least ourselves and maybe even some others around us. Thereby not allowing us to continue in the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven for any length of time. We learn in the scripture, I can't remember exactly what verse that, you know, people end up destroying each other. First of all, it's, you find, um, and I wish I did have the, the verses right now, but we, we read in the Apocrypha, I believe, somewhere that when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, they first destroy themselves like fighting and you know shooting each other or you know stabbing each other whatever and then after that illnesses kind of you know take them out and so it's not really a you know sudden seven billion people that are exterminated at one time but it 
happens over the course of maybe, you know, a few years or something like that. But anyway, it will be all associated with whether or not these powers are a part of our life or not. But all is well. I mean, we learn in subsequent verses that we have the opportunity to correct and we're even given a little time to do so as of now, at least so. Praise our Father in heaven, hallowed be his name. We'll start to do more classes on the Shepherd of Hermas. If you got anything out of this one, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. But leave us a comment either way, and I'll see you there.